Assalamu alaikum and good evening, everybody. My name is Fada, and I'm the head of events and partnerships here at Pet Me Appeal USA, joining you live from Columbia, Maryland. On behalf of the um, on behalf of myself and the Penny Appeal team, thank you all for joining us tonight, live up from around the country, uh, whether it be on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. We welcome you to tonight's um, informative program, and I hope, inshallah, that you are able to benefit from our panelists tonight. Um, I'm truly excited to host you all tonight and pick up from where we left off a couple of weeks ago. Um, a few weeks ago, we, we started this uh, talk, discussion, um, and unfortunately, we weren't able to get through so much. So um, welcoming you tonight for part two of our COVID discussion. Um, this evening, we'll be discussing the impact of COVID on American families all over the country. Um, as we all know, COVID has affected everyone's life in so many ways. It's taken a toll on physical health, mental health, um, financial and economic uh, stability. Last year, with your support, we were able to raise over $1.5 million, uh, which helped over 1,400 families affected um, affected with financial hardship. When we launched the campaign, we were flooded with applications with the, and with your generosity and the generosity of our supporters, we were able to provide cash grants to over 1,400 families, which assisted over 4,300 individuals in 37 states. Now, two thirds of those um, recipients uh, reported income of less than $1,000 to no income at all. A quarter of the recipients were immigrants or asylum seekers. The need was so much that we decided to launch uh, phase two last month in the beginning of January. And so far we've raised over $330,000 and have already assisted over 600 individuals. Please consider supporting our program, our campaign by visiting launchgood.com slash COVID relief. The more money we're able to raise, the more families we can offer financial assistance to. Please help and share and support this campaign with families and friends. We have assisted over 600 individuals so far and so many more applications are still in need of your support. This evening, we'll, we'll explore, explore uh, mental health, physical health and the impact that COVID has had on families and countries and communities across the US with Dr. Ahmed Youssef, Dr. Raisa Menezuela, Dr. Susie Ismail. But before we jump into tonight's program, I wanna pause for a brief video. So, so please stay tuned and we hope to see you all very, very soon. We're now in January of 2021 and millions of American families continue to suffer the economic consequences of COVID-19 and this global pandemic. Yes, families received $600 or $1,200 from the government COVID relief bill. It's just not enough. If you're paying for rent, if you're paying for food, if you're paying for medical expenses and prescriptions, if you're trying to get your children through school, $600, $1,200 is simply not enough to make ends meet. With your support, last year, we raised 1.5 million US dollars that went to families in need. Over 1,300 families benefited from your generosity. We've relaunched the campaign and we encourage you, please, today, to help families in need. Visit launchgood.com forward slash COVID relief to support these efforts. Thank you. Welcome back. And uh, thank you for tuning in so far. Um, I want to take this time to introduce our um, panelists for tonight. First up, we have Dr. Ahmed Youssef. Dr. Youssef is, um, uh, is the medical director of the intensive care unit. He is a double board certified physician in internal medicine and pediatrics. He currently works as both a hospitalist and a medical director. Dr. Youssef helps manage the care of the most vulnerable patients in the hospital and helps bridge the gap between different levels of the, of the care team from their team of 11 hospitalists to the respiratory therapy team to 
to the nursing team, to the hospital administration, and so forth. His passion revolves around refugee medical mission work. Mashallah, he's had the honor of meeting and caring for some of the most vulnerable people in the world. Please welcome Dr. Ahmed Yusuf. Assalamu alaikum, thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. Thank you for uh, joining us. Um, and too bad we're not gonna be able to meet your kids tonight. <laughs> but we'll see you all um, our next speaker for tonight is Dr. Raisa Manizuela. Dr. Raisa is a licensed clinical physician in the state of Maryland. She received a Bachelor of Science degree in psychology from University of Maryland. She also earned a Doctor of a Psychology degree from LaSalle University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where she has trained in the cognitive behavioral approach of treatment. Dr. Manjuela then went to complete a postdoctoral fellowship in forensic psychology. She currently works at Clearview Counseling Center, providing therapy for individuals experiencing a wide range of mental health issues, including depression, anxiety, so social anxiety, anger, grief, and trauma. Please help me welcome Dr. Raisa Manjuela. Thank you, Dr. Raisa. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for having me again. It's good to be here. It's good to have you, Dr. Dr. Manjwala. Our last but not least, Dr. Suzy Ismail. Dr. Suzy is the founding director at Cornerstone Marriage and Family Intervention, a nonprofit, a nonprofit faith based community. Um, sorry about that. Uh, Dr. S Dr. Ismail is the founding director at Cornerstone Marriage and Family Intervention, a nonprofit faith-based communication intervention organization with several locations around the world that focus on youth, family, marriage, identity, socio-emotional socio wellness, and, and relationship uh, rebuilding. She specializes in education, and empowering women, youth, vulnerable populations by presenting a range of workshops, lectures, programs, diverse seminars, and corporate trainings, both nationally and internationally. Dr. Suzy Ismail has traveled to the border of Syria to work with refugee women, families, and orphans, and continues her work with resettlements and relief agencies providing integration intervention. For more year, for many years, Dr. Ismail has served as an executive officer and director on several nonprofit boards, commissions, and organizations. She holds a Master of Arts in Communications and Master of, of Philosophy in Human Services and a PhD in Human Services, focusing on family studies and interventional strategies. Please help me welcome Dr. Suzy Ismail. Thank you, Dr. Suzy, for joining us tonight. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Alaikum assalam. Thank you all. Um, I wanted to kick off tonight's uh, discussion. Um, I wanted to kind of pick up where we left off last time. I know last time we discussed um, the impact that it's had, that COVID has had on individuals and how, um, and how we can... Uh, what we can do to help ourselves and what we can do to sort of seek help and seek assistance from professionals. Um, and with that said, Dr. Raisa, um, I know that after we finished, we got a question through our chat and uh, Dr. Raisa was able to um, cover that for us. And um, I would like you to Talk about how what is it in, terms of, in terms of help or seeking additional professional um, assistance. You broke up a little bit. Can you repeat that? Um, what I was was what I was asking was what uh, what what is your suggestion in terms of seeking medical assistance or medical help um, from professionals and what should we do 
what are things that we can do at home, what are things that we can do as individuals seeking um, mental health issues revolving around um, being home, being stuck at home, taking away from that social, um, the socialness that we used to have before COVID came in. Mm -hmm. So just what can we do at home for our mental health and reaching out? Um, yeah, like I mentioned, um, you know, reaching out to a therapist um, can be really helpful. Everything is really convenient right now well, with the teletherapy and the telehealth platform. A lot of insurance, uh, some of them are even waiving the co-pays for the telehealth right now during the pandemic. Um, you can even, on psychologytoday.com, you can even try to look for a Muslim therapist if, if you feel like you'd, you'd be more comfortable with a Muslim therapist who can really understand your values and beliefs. Um, but yeah, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about therapy. It's not like you're crazy or there's something wrong with you. It's really just learning how to adjust to these challenges, especially during the pandemic you know, really adjusting to this new normal, um, finding out, developing new interests, keeping yourself busy, still living according to your values. Um, you know, exercise is one of the main things we recommend. You can still go out, have some physical activity, you know, taking walks, keeping your distance, wearing your mask at all times. Um, that can really help improve mood, make it fun, biking, you know, hiking, um, you know, in the summer, outdoor activities, um, things like that, doing things at home, like reading, you know, doing some art, if that's interesting, you know, as Muslims, you know, take the time to do maybe what you've always wanted to do, like learn some new surahs or reading, reciting the Quran, being really mindful, like in your salah can be really helpful. Um, and yeah, always just staying socially connected. Social distancing doesn't mean social isolation. So using technology to connect. Thank you so much, Dr. Ritsa. Um, Can you USA supports refugees around the world? How has the pandemic specifically impacted communities involved in? Dr. Uh, Susie, I know that you work with refugees um, here in, in the US. And um, I know through grants that we've uh, we've helped out with, you were able to support them. But what have you seen uh, with the refugee community that you've helped out? Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, it is uh, it's it's nice to be gathering again in this way. Although I know uh, we're all longing to gather in person. Um, hopefully, sometime soon, inshallah, in the near future, we'll be able to do that again. Um, you know, the topic of, of refugees and refugee wellness is, is an incredibly important one. And it affects us because as we've welcomed refugees, uh, you know, in, in previous years, um, in the year 2016 and onward from there, um, we, we see that the refugee community has been struggling, trying to integrate within the Western community in the U.S. And it has uh, been, of course, uh, with its own challenges and its own difficulties. Uh, what we're seeing with COVID-19 right now, at the start of the pandemic, um, back in March of 2020, there was a lot of information, um, and among our refugee clients that we serve uh, across the U.S. and, and also in, in uh, Europe and, and Canada, we were seeing a, a lot of difficulty with traumatization and PTSD. Um, uh, many of our clients were feeling uh, many of the same feelings that they felt when they were trapped at home due to bombs and wars and um, other types of trauma that they were experiencing. So one of the first things that we wanted to do was to build a sense of community um, because that sense of community is something that drives many of us. And, and we feel it ourselves now a year into the pandemic, um, particularly during those early months of lockdown of not being able to connect with others. So to build that sense of community, we started um, putting together WhatsApp groups and what started as local WhatsApp groups to uh, you know, the Arabic speaking community, the refugees, the Dari speaking, the Tagumi speaking, the, um, we had, I think we had about seven or eight different WhatsApp groups in in the different uh, uh, languages. Um, and we 
U.S. app groups. Primarily, you know, we figured we'd do the tri-state area, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Um, within two weeks, we had each WhatsApp group had hundreds of, of people that had signed into it. We wound up adding three more languages and it was incredible just being able to streamline. We would, you know, do a video um, a week of in the language of the community that we were serving, just giving them an update, translating the news reports, um, giving some sense of calm. Um, and I know that was something that made a huge difference to our refugee clients because we are so used to giving food. We are so used to, you know, sending money giving uh, furniture, giving clothing, which are all very important tertiary needs. But when we look at, you know, our, our hierarchy of needs, when we look at the, the emotional needs, a lot of times, you know, we start with the, the, the physiological, we start with that safety, security, food, we work our way up. But a lot of times our refugee community gets lost at the love belonging level, or we get lost at, you know, trying to push them towards self-actualization, which is a very uh, Western model, when really what our research has shown us and what our experiences has shown us in working with refugees of various communities, the, the need is a need for self-transcendence, a need of feeling a, a connection to community, a need of feeling like you're part of a bigger whole. And that's been one of the biggest blows I think that COVID has dealt to many of us um, and refugees included, that disconnected feeling. And so whatever ways that we can connect, whether it's through WhatsApp or through Zoom or um, through phone calls, um, I think that's been the saving grace almost of being able to work through the pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Susie. Sorry, I was looking for my unmute button. <laughs> thank you so. Uh, thank you for covering that, um, Dr. Raisa. Is there anything that you would like to add uh, based on your uh, work with um, patients? Yeah, the yeah the social connection is definitely important to emphasize. Like Dr. Smile was saying. Um, that sense of belonging. A lot of people have been feeling really lonely, um, you know, missing their lives, going out in the social world. Um, but there's so many resources and ways to connect online. Um, there's this website called meetup.com. And usually it was in person to meet new people, um, wherever cities you're in, like book clubs and hiking groups and art groups and film clubs and things like that. But now they're doing a lot of that stuff online. So that's a great resource I suggest to my clients um, to still be able to socialize, meet new people locally in your area. Maybe you can meet them later on um, when things are, are safer. Um, but that's really important to just, you know, still take advantage of the technology to connect with people. And Dr. Youssef, um, I know that you are, I mean, you're in the hospital all day, so I'm pretty sure that you see a lot of it happening um, in person. What are like? What are some of the stories, or what are some of the things that you've been dealing with um, in the hospital? Yeah, you know, I think I think the uh, both doctors have already mentioned some of the, the key issues, right? And and I think uh, one of the things I think back to is certain fields, right, in in healthcare or or, or otherwise. Uh, it's almost like you're supposed to have a prerequisite to have somebody else that you that could be your own psychologist or psychiatrist, right? So, you know, many psychiatrists have a, a secondary person that they, uh, you know, unload uh, some of the burden of, of, of having to deal with a high stress environment. Um, and, and, and when we think about refugees and, you know, the many places I've been with refugee work, uh, you know, the sense of community of Dr. Ismail spoke about was the key way that they were able to cope, right? It was the only way they were able to cope was feeling part of uh, finding a purpose within the community that they were doing that made them feel uh, like they had power over the small things they could have power over. I think paralleling that to where we are, where everybody collectively has experienced, uh, and, and this isn't to compare it to, to, ref, to, to, to the refugee situation, but just a collective trauma in some respect uh, that's been prolonged and drawn out and, and, and uh, kind of beaten over our head to a certain extent, and the loneliness and, and all the things and the harm that can come as a consequence of those uh, environments. You know, you may have to find your person, right? Or or people, right? You have to find your, I think Dr. Manishwala said it right, right? You know, find a therapist, right? Find somebody. And if you can't find a therapist on the front end, um, you know, find people in the community, uh, you know, who, who who you can look to, to be your uh, soundboard and to be to, to be at least the beginnings of conversations of of healing and managing and coping with, with all this kind of collective 
uh, difficulty and hardship people are going through. Yeah, one thing that we saw in um, that we saw from the applications were a lot of these um, refugees or or uh, people who are not documented coming in, they're not getting the financial assistance that other people are getting. So they're not qualifying for some for certain assistance, and it's it's taken a toll on them. And I, um, I mean, when I read some of the some of the testimonies or some of the applications, it almost makes you want to think like. What are we doing here? Um, and that is why we've been. Do well, that's why we've been promoting this campaign. Um, if I could say w w one thing in, in this regard, I think you know I will tell you I had a uh, where I am in Arkansas. Um, you know th there are there's a, a a relatively large community of undocumented um, you know people that are that are working and, and so on and so forth. And there have been little clusters of outbreaks uh, surrounding coronavirus. I, it's amplified in those communities, right? The difficulty is amplified layer after layer. Uh, one, because you can imagine being stuck in the hospital with COVID sucks already, right? You, you're sick and you're scared and you don't know that tomorrow is going to be better than today. Your oxygen requirements continue to increase. You're starving for oxygen. There's a level of physiologic adrenaline and, and anxiety associated with those things, even beyond feeling anxious typically in, in, a, in a terribly uncomfortable environment. And then imagine uh, not understanding what the doctors are saying. Right. And not understanding or easily communicating your needs, uh, you know, despite translator services and despite those things existing, it's it's definitely not the same when things don't ring true, uh, you know, for, for when you're not able to feel like you can express your own uh, needs. Right. And so we've seen that a ton in the hospital. It's it's heartbreaking because you're alone anyway. Uh, you aren't allowed visitors in a lot of these contexts. And then beyond it. Uh, the very simple things we typically do when things are normal, like like have a translator or a family member at the bedside to help translate needs, um, are, are are lost or at least at least uh, you know decreased in value. And so, finding those people and finding ways of helping them, uh, I, I can't think of anything more Muslim to do right in, in this time when everybody's struggling is finding the people that are struggling worse than you and 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 finding meaning and in, in trying to help them. Dr. Susie, um, how have you been able to? cope with your community or refugees that you're helping out with. Yeah. Um, have you seen any patients or any um, any uh, individuals from within your communities that were patients that suffered what Dr. Uh, Ahmed Yusuf was talking about right now? Yeah, no, I think it's 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 great that Dr. Ahmed mentioned the the linguistic element um, and the difficulties of understanding why um, they would have to be alone in the hospital. Um, and I think in addition to the emotional uh, damage or the emotional repercussions, of course, we can't you know deny or ignore the physical, um, the loss of life, the loss of wealth, you know, the loss of um, you know what little wealth there was that was sustaining the family is no longer there. Um, the loss of job, the loss of um, just a feeling of, of normalcy. Um, and on top of that, you know, one of the big things that we're also seeing is the drop in terms of education. I mean, many of the children in our refugee communities were struggling uh, from the get-go in terms of adjusting to uh, school, adjusting to the education system here. And then suddenly you slap on this virtual education where children who know the language, who know the culture, who are comfortable, are struggling now multiply that by 10 for families who are you know are, are really really struggling and don't have the laptop don't have access to um, the devices uh, to be able to educate their children and so unfortunately in this year in the refugee community we have seen a uh, just an astronomical increase in high school dropouts in children leaving school at whatever age they're allowed to leave school um, we see again from an education standpoint, children who, when they enter into the US school system as refugees, get lost in the system. And so they never do learn the language. Um, many of them come from uh, camps or from you know other areas where they had uh, initial resettlement without knowing how to read or write in their own languages, let alone learning to read and write or being placed into a grade level that's far beyond where they are. So we've seen education repercussions, we've seen financial repercussions, we've seen physical repercussions, we've seen emotional repercussions, and all of this, of course, ties back to mental health difficulties and repercussions. Um, and so it's, you know, you, you kind of find your corner and you try to 
tackle what you can. I think like, you know, the, the famous Mr. Rogers line, you know, look for the helpers, but also be the helper if you can't find those helpers. So if you know that you speak a language, so for example, we were struggling to find the Tigrinya speaker and we had a lot of people that needed that. Um, and, you know, alhamdulillah, we found a volunteer that kind of came out of nowhere and was amazing in, in assisting in that area. Find what you can help with. And it's, you know, uh, one of the, the proven kind of, um, uh, I guess, non-medical uh, remedies for those who sometimes struggle with their own depression or their own uh, mental health difficulties um, is to help someone else. And in extending that hand, you're kind of helping yourself as well. Thank you, Dr. Susie. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Raisa, would you like, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Yeah, that's great, you know, just, um, Adding to what Dr. Smile said, um, that can bring about a lot of meaning to our lives when we're helping other people. Um, you know, uh, a lot of purpose. Um, and in a way, you know, Islamically, that's part of our worship as well. You know, just helping other people, um, living a meaningful life. I always recommend volunteering to my clients, you know, to find some kind of purpose, to enjoy something that they're passionate about, finding some kind of cause, seeing how you can help out. Um, and that can uh, really be helpful for our mental health. And, and like, you, like Dr. Smile said, like it helps others and then it's helping you at the same time, helping you feel better about yourself. A lot of people want some kind of purpose, obviously in their lives and, um, so that really kind of helps them and finding maybe some ways online, you know, I know everything's online now, but finding a way you can contribute, um, doing something online. Um, for instance, in college, I used to provide support for abuse victims on an online hotline, like an online chat. So, you know, finding something you're passionate about and they should have something that you can do virtually. I keep losing that unmute button. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Dr. Raisa. Um, my next question for tonight is, uh, how often do you find young, healthy patients being admitted? And what seems to be the most common ways that people are getting affected? And are you seeing a pattern or spike, um, especially after a long weekend? And what would your, what's your suggestion, Dr. Youssef? So, you know, um, I'm going to be as thorough with this answer because it's, it's, a, it's an important one to, to, to understand the reality and, and, and also kind of speak to, um, you know, actual absolute scientific risks, right? So this is just being forward and honest. The vast majority of people that are negatively affected by COVID or above the age of 65 um, are, are in terms of mortality, talking about death specifically. And... Um, or uh, of the younger populations that, that seem to really be affected um, are, are have significant comorbidities, specifically morbid obesity being being one even more than, than lung disease, right? Which is kind of counter to what we think of a lot of diseases uh, from an infectious disease standpoint. Um, diabetes seems to be a huge player also. Um, so th those are the two major factors. If you asked me, uh, have I seen somebody young uh, die in the hospital from COVID in the last nine months? I've seen many. I've seen many die, um, you know. Uh, not nearly as much as the elderly population, though, right? This disease process vastly affects ages differently. It's the truth of um, the disease process at this point, statistically, as things become more clear over the course of the last year. That, however, me saying that and understanding those statistics uh, doesn't mitigate responsibility from us to take care of everybody uh, in our community and take appropriate, uh, you know, uh, risk management thought processes and 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 for that for that in our family. Um, because the people who get affected are our neighbors in our, in our community, right? Along with that though, par parallel to that also, is uh, the, the problem with COVID and the problem with the, the overutilization of medical facilities, hospitals and all that other stuff, is that uh, people uh, will or may have had already uh, gotten sicker, suffered morbidity, injury um, or complications, or died from other disease processes related to the fact that, you know, access to the typical stuff we're used to being uh, accessible or weren't there or could, you know, potentially not be there if there's another flare up. So that's kind of the question, the first part of the question. The second part of the question, um, 
there's no doubt, right? The, the, the peaks in this country have been associated with uh, gatherings, right? I, I, we just now finally are seeing a downsloping trend from the uh, winter break associated with the Christmas holiday, right? It's just, it's pretty straightforward. Two to three to four weeks after Christmas, there was a humongous peak in this country and it lasted pretty long up until about a week ago. Uh, and then if you look in the last week or so, there's been a downtrend um, because large family gatherings and friendly gatherings definitely spread the disease quickly. And those gatherings, even if there are a bunch of young people at those gatherings, you take it home to your family and to grandpa and grandma. And then all of a sudden the hospitals are full again of really sick, lonely people who are dying alone. And I say that uh, because that's what's happening, right? So there's no doubt that people are dying. You know, I, I, I'm going to tell a quick story, uh, not to believe, but... I was at a gym uh, meeting somebody uh, recently who owned the gym uh, in a local town here and we were talking about things and he said, you know, COVID doesn't, it's not real, right? It doesn't really exist. And he didn't know yet I was a physician who works on the COVID unit in multiple hospitals. He said, hey, you know, it's not, it's not real. Look, I'm an old, he was 60 something years old. I'm, I'm healthy and I'm, I, I'm good, right? And, uh, and there's still, that, that, that theme still exists somehow in, in a country with enough media to, you think, uh, teach away, right? The myths. Um, but, but you have to be resistant to uh, the conspiracy theories and those type of things and go to the people who kind of are, are on the front lines of dealing with it. Right. And I can promise you on my medical license in my life that, that, you know, the ICUs have been full for many months with people that were dying of COVID. And so that's a really important thing. So how do you take precautions? Uh, it's the stuff we've heard over and over drilled into us over and over again. I do think, uh, Donna Commander brought up a couple of points about using the IT world to to maintain social ties. I think that's super valuable. And I think I would take it a, another step further and say there's still ways to meet people in a safe way in the COVID context. Physically, you can't be within six feet of them and you can't wear not wear masks, especially if you're going into different environments. So that there's things you have to common sense do. And if you do those things, then you really have to stay away from people that are elderly. Right. It's all about mitigating risk and measuring the pros and cons of dealing in certain environments. Um, you just have to take those things into account. We talk to your family and your close circle of friends, keep the bubbles small, right? But the bubbles can exist as long as you do it, do it in a safe manner, so. Thank you so much, Dr. Yusuf. Um, my, the second part of that question that I wanted to uh, follow up on was, uh, you, touched, you, you touched on that, you and Dr. Raisa using technology. Um, I, for one, have not left the house in many, 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 many months. Um, but what do I do? I keep in touch with everybody through FaceTime, through Zoom, through uh, phone calls and so on and so forth. Um, and just like you said, now you could even play games. Like I play Uno with my friend in California virtually. Um, and I think it's very important for people to realize that just because we cannot be out and about, it's not the end of the world. We need to find ways or we need to think outside the box to sort of um, still keep, it, keep being engaged and still meet people, still keep in touch with our family and friends and check up on our family and friends. Uh, it doesn't mean that I have to be in your face um, to make sure that I am reaching out to you. And it doesn't necessarily mean that I have to be sitting next to you to uh, you know, say what's up. So thank you so much, um, doctors, all three of you for touching up on that. Uh, the next question that I, leading up to that was, um, and I feel like you did mention most of it, was uh, tips that you give your patients to prevent. So these are tips that you've been giving your patients to prevent the spread or to prevent um, to prevent the virus, whether it be um, patients that you've seen or preventative care or patients that are being discharged? And what are some of the testimonials that you're getting from your, from your, um, your patients, whether it be in the hospital or in your practice or Dr. Susie uh, with patients that you're dealing with within the community? So I, I think, you know, there's there's already been a lot of great tips shared in terms of uh, emotional wellness and, and you know, taking care of oneself and, and trying to reach out and, and being there in, in whatever way that you can be. 
Um, I think maybe the other aspects that we want to look at is financial wellness um, and you know, financial factors and financial health have a huge impact on um, not just individual well-being, but also on family structure and family well-being. Um, we are definitely seeing an increase in domestic violence cases, um, in uh, issues of uh, abuse within the home. Um, and a lot of times when you're digging a bit deeper, you're finding that, you know, the uh, eruptions of anger may be coming from a loss of hope, a sense of, you know, not knowing where the next meal is going from not knowing how you're going to pay the bill. Um, of course, this doesn't justify this action by any means, um, but we're, we are understanding that we can provide anger management classes, we can put restraining orders on people, but if we're not getting to the root of the problem, you know, what is it that's causing the breakdown within the household, then we're not fixing the problem. We're simply you know, separating the family for a short period of time, not fixing the core issue. Um, so, you know, dealing with financial issues if you are struggling with financial issues if you are worried about the future if you have a high level of uncertainty avoidance and are struggling with anxiety or stress do not take it out on your family you know find avenues for help even if you feel like you can't afford speaking to a therapist or a counselor um i promise you there are other avenues of help speak to an imam speak to um you know a, a someone that you can reach out to on the crisis text hotline um but find other outlets do not allow your stress to call, turn into an eruption um within the household even if there aren't financial problems just being in uh, each other's uh, vicinity i'm um, trying to uh, manage children who are uh, schooling or being educated from home parents who are working from home um in a world where we've grown to become very individualistic and you know everyone's got their own path you know you everyone wakes up early in the morning runs out the door and then you don't gather again until um the evening COVID has definitely turned that upside down on its head. You know, people who would travel for business have not traveled in a year, you know, um, people who would physically go to work. So if this is causing a strain in the relationship in the home, again, find outlets, you know, take some time to, you know, every day as, as, as a mother, maybe take, you know, 15 minutes where you take a walk, um, have someone else watch the children for a little bit formulate those pods. I think Dr. Ahmed was talking a little bit about having that safety net, that group that is your group, um, interchange babysitting, you know, let someone watch the kids for a little bit. As partners, husband and wife, you know, make it a, a, a goal where maybe after Salat al-Fajr, you know, you're having time together, but then you're also having time apart, you know. Um, but honestly, creating a safe environment in the home for uh, husband, wife, children is important. And for those who are single parents who are struggling and feeling like they have to do it all alone right now, you know, working, trying to maintain the household financially and trying to take care of children who are now home and, and trying to figure out virtual education, take a breath, just breathe, because it's not easy and, and it's not meant to be done alone. So we go back to that line that we mentioned before, look for the helpers. They're there. I promise you, you know, Allah Azza wa Jal does not give us a test without also giving us the, the solution to that test or the way to find ease in that difficulty. Um, and, you know, reach out. You can reach out to Dr. Raisa. I'm sure you can reach out to Dr. Ahmad, myself, to Huda, um, and, and to Penny Appeal. I mean, these are people and organizations that want to help. Um, don't just kind of throw your hands in the air and give up. This is a difficult time for everyone in all walks of life. Um, whatever your difficulty, inshallah, we can find a solution. Yeah, I think I think I think Dr. Smith hit on exactly this beautiful thought process in my head that she kind of started by by talking about somebody looking for help, and then the person who they look for help to was looking for help by being somebody to serve somebody, right? And I think that's that's probably existing in an environment around us. Uh, without us realizing it, right? Just like, you know, the person who's looking for a little bit of support, there's somebody out there who, who wants to give support as their means of dealing and coping with, with their own issues. And so, uh, especially in the Muslim community, right? I think that there's a ton of avenues, especially through the message and, and you know, all these organizations like Penny Appeal. Um, oh, and again, right, like reaching out to to people um, like Hoda and, 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 and Dr. Sman, Dr. Manjwell and, and myself to help connect uh, you with those people is something that obviously that, that we'd be excited to do, um, there's no doubt during this time without specific uh, figures in my life that I could escape to, right? From my own home sometimes, right? Just naturally uh, or from work, uh, I, I'd be in a much worse place, right? And then and during the dark times of whatever period of this crazy thing that's been going on for the last, you know, 10 months a year, uh, there were times where if I didn't have the outlet, if I didn't have 
uh, a way of, of, you know, again, right, finding a, somebody I could I could just go to and and, uh, and and outside of my my little tiny bubble, but you know, but the in, in the greater sphere, uh, I think I think I'd be in, in big trouble. The last thing I'll say is something that I warn myself uh, about to myself often, right? Is is uh, nobody's doing well keeping it together during this time, right? I think there's like this sometimes, especially because it's all tech related and we get little snippets of people and especially in social media, uh, there's a feeling like, man, everybody seems to be having such a freaking good time, right? And and uh, and this is terrible, right? And and uh, I, I can assure you as somebody who treats a lot of people and is involved a lot of people and is one of those people themselves, uh, every uh, it's hard, this, this is a, a cruddy situation for, for, for people and, and we can all commiserate with you. And because of that, you should know that there's people who, who, who you can reach out to. Thank you so much. Uh, that was that was awesome. Um, and I, I, I echo what you said about, you know, not everyone is happy. Um, whatever pictures you're seeing on social media, it, I mean, don't look at those pictures and say, hey, you know, lucky them, they're having a good time and I'm here miserable. Just know that we're all in the same boat, <laughs> basically. Um, and I know I, I've, I've heard testimonies from um, recipients. One application that I, that I uh, processed um, during phase one, um, I, was, I was torn when I read it. It was um, a family of seven who couldn't, could no longer pay for rent. So they were, um, they had to leave their home and they were um, shoved into a homeless shelter. And because of the family size and the ages, they were split up into two different shelters. The mother and the little kids went to one shelter and the older kids went to another shelter. What happened was the mother ended up catching COVID in the shelter and she had the little kids with her while the older ones were trying to work while trying to just try to live through what they're going through. Um, I could only imagine the impact that it's had on the kids um, that are staying at the shelter um, while trying to virtually learn, trying to go to school virtually, trying to adjust to this whole new living without a home, without a school to go back to. Um, and a lot of people were, a lot of these families, they look forward to going to school because that's where they get their meals. Um, these kids, that's where they get their breakfast and lunch. Um, and then this all happened and everything was kind of switched well, it kind of got turned upside down on them. Um, and I could only imagine, and I'm not, even, I'm not a doctor, but I could only imagine the impact that it's had on their lives. Um, now, what, what would you say to people, what would, what would you say to the viewers that are in that situation that are listening to you right now? Dr. Raisa? Sorry, uh, could you repeat that question again? Um, what I was saying is, what would you, what would you say to those viewers that um, that went through that financial hardship where they lost everything and um, basically these kids that are basically never had to deal with they never had to, deal with kids, you know, have to um, be homeless and go through a pandemic and leave school all at the same time. I mean, it's hard mm -hmm. for adults, but when I think of the kids who have never imagined going through this, it kind of reminds me of the refugees that went through war overseas that were through one day and then the next day they woke up and everything was torn apart. Um, mm -hmm. what, what are your, what's your advice to them? Yeah, so that's uh, really heartbreaking, you know, hearing about a family like that who just lost everything, being in a homeless shelter and, you know, catching, ex being exposed to the virus. Um, you know, I talked to my clients about, you know, really taking it one day at a time, you know, trying to see what you can do in this moment that's in your control, you know, whether it's, um, you know, out there looking for a job. I have a client who lost her job at the restaurant waitressing and so she had to move back in with her parents. And so trying to see who can maybe shelter you, reaching out to family and friends, 
you know, hopefully they'll understand that situation. Um, taking it one step at a time, look, trying to look for a job or someone who can connect you to some kind of way to make, make some money for your family. Um, you know, a lot of people are worrying a lot during the pandemic, like what if something happens to my loved one? What if this happens and that happens? Try to ground yourself, bring yourself back in the present moment of like, okay, right now in this moment, you know, um, this is the situation where the kids are safe right now, we're, we're, we're doing okay. Um, we'll worry about that when the time comes. Um, so really, you know, trying to solve one problem at a time like you guys, all of the doctors have said, you know, reaching out to, you know, those who can help you in the moment with what you're going through. Um, and like y'all said, of course, you know, Allah is always there with us, you know, making dua, you know, the, don't underestimate the power of dua and really ask Allah for help, even for little things, even for those big things. Um, and having faith, you know, um, in Allah to, you know, help you and, and hopefully find that helper, you know, that Allah can connect us with. You know, I think uh, Dr. Rizal hit on something that I was going to say, say before, but I, you know, a lot of times in these really clinical conversations, um, we remove the spirituality of it all, right? I know these two doctors don't do that, but, but, and I do it often, um, is, is I'll just talk about the physiology and the, you know, the medicine and the what's going on neurotransmitters in your brain, right? When you're not feeling so good. Um, but, but all of that uh, only works in the context of our recognition of our relationship with, with the one who created us, right? It do, doesn't, it doesn't make sense unless um, none of this makes any sense, right? COVID makes absolutely no sense. And the death and the difficulty makes no sense, except in the context um, that we are being cared for uh, by, by the one who created us knows us better. Uh, then we could know ourselves and, and has a plan that we don't o often uh, understand, um, you know, until until things uh, become clear. And so uh, I, something that I have been doing for myself, and it's not a medical advice, it's just my own personal advice for myself, is, uh, you know, Dr. Sheikh Yasser Fahmi, who uh, I made a joke, uh, it's Sheikh Yasser Fahmi, um, you know, he, I remember once he was giving a khatara to us in the middle of the night in Ramadan, and he was saying, Close your eyes and uh, imagine yourself in front of a lost Ta'ala, right? And it's an impossible thing to do, of course, right? But but you just imagine yourself in front of Allah in whatever way your brain can imagine it. And as you magnify, as you as you back out of that, right? As you kind of zoom out, uh, you keep getting smaller, and Allah Ta'ala still exists in His vastness and and in His mercy and power and, and ability uh, until you are no longer visible, right? And that. Uh, he was trying to put us in the mindset of making God. Ah, that's that's why Dr. Venezuela's comment rang true for me. But you know, when you do that, then these things that we struggle with in this moment, um, at least for for the moment, you're able to keep your eyes closed, uh, see, seem really small in the uh, comparison to, to to the one who created us and created the environment that we live in. So um, that's just my own personal in the moment. Getting trying to find a way of getting in the moment, the way Dr. Venezuela was saying, right? How do we return to the present moment for a second and not think about all these scary things that that are real, right? And and are truly scary is is uh, come back to this moment, recognize your your position in front of the one who created you. Yeah, and just one more thing to add to uh, what Dr. Yusuf was saying, that spiritual component. You know, remember our remembering our beloved prophets, peace be upon them, the hardships they went through, the challenges, the grief, you know, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam experience a lot of grief, losing a lot of family members. Um, and a lot of people think, oh, if I'm this is happening to me, I'm not strong through this, my faith is weak, or I'm being punished. But that's not true. You know, our prophets had the strongest faith and you know they went through these hardships and they they got through it, you know, with that faith in Allah. Um, so you know, find that in the Quran, you know, that your story, your your hardship and um you know, know that you, you, you know, it doesn't mean that you're weak in your faith. It's just Allah testing us and you test those who he loves. So it's important to remember that. Thank you so much. Um, my next, and I guess the last question that I want to uh, close the night with is, 
Sorry, I just lost it. Coping with anxiety and the stress during COVID-19. Now dealing with uncertainty, uncertainty and ambiguity is challenging for most of us under regular circumstances. Add a pandemic into the mix and a spike in your, in your anxiety levels is inevitable. There's a lot of uncertainty about COVID-19 and how much, sorry, and much of it is outside of your control. No amount of worry will change that fact with that said, what are some positive steps that we can take to cope with um, with the uncomfortable feeling that we're experiencing? And what do you foresee in the near future? Now, I know that the COVID vaccine is out and I know that life is supposed to be going back to semi-normal um, from now to the end of the year, um, the vaccine is being distributed. Um, but in the meantime, I know that we've had a year to kind of get used to it. But what are your, uh, what's your advice to the viewers to cope with the rest of the year? What are some of the next steps to some of the final steps? Um, some advice that you'd like to share with uh, viewers that are viewing our webinar tonight. And this is open to everybody. Dr. Susie. So, you know, I think as I was listening to um, the other speakers uh, speaking about our faith and, you know, how faith can be a coping mechanism, there's been a lot of buzz this year on the apps that are out there like Headspace and Calm and Mindful. Um, and some of these apps are, are amazing in just reminding us to breathe, reminding us to uh, bring ourselves back to the present, um, grounding techniques, mindfulness techniques. Um, but I've also gotten a lot of questions from uh, the Muslim community, you know, asking like, is it okay if I meditate? And, you know, would that be wrong? And, you know, subhanAllah, we turn to the Qur'an and we see that Allah Azza wa Jal reminds us that it is surely but by the remembrance of Allah that the hearts find ease. Um, and so, you know, bringing in the components of our faith and that's something that, you know, we, we do at Cornerstone. We really do try to speak to people from a faith-based perspective. Um, bring in the components of your faith. Know how you connect with Allah Azza wa Jal. Um, you know, if you're using one of those apps like Headspace, um, use it as, as a moment of dhikr, you know, where you are remembering Allah Azza wa Jal. Um, recognize and understand the names of Allah. Know that He is Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Know that even in the worst of difficulties, His Rahmah is there. Um, and I think utilizing that those aspects of faith as a connector to something greater than ourselves, greater than our trauma, greater than our difficulty, greater than our loss. There's no greater coping mechanism out there. Um, and regardless of where you see yourself on the scale of religiosity, you know, sometimes people will say, well, I don't pray. How can I really turn to Allah? Allah Azza wa Jal is there, you know, regardless of where we stand, whether we miss Fajr or we pray Fajr, whether we're late for Asr or we skip it entirely, you know, always turning back to him um, at whatever stage in our life we're at. Um, there's there's no better coping mechanism. So I think that's uh, probably the, the the last bit that I'd want to share. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Susie. I think that was uh, beautifully stated. I, for, for for me, it's it's uh, allow yourself to be optimistic and hopeful, right? You know, I think the doom and gloom is so easy to just buy into and and, and eat up. Uh, one because it's good news, right? And so that's what you're going to hear a lot of, uh, and and. But, but there's no reason not to be optimistic, right? Alhamdulillah, we've gone through a lot of things in the last 30 years, right? You know, since <laughs> 35 years since I've been alive, right? So it's just a lot of things that happened and everybody thought that after one big event, the end of the world was coming. And this is one of those big events that will uh, be memorable one way or the other, right? But but inshallah, many years from now, we'll look back and talk about the terrible years of 2020 and, and, and part of 2021 where we all got stuck in our houses. Um, but, but there's no reason not to be optimistic that the vaccine is going to be useful and helpful, that we're getting better at treating patients in the hospital, which we are, um, you know, mortality rates have decreased significantly in, 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 in terms of the people who are, are, are dead. It's, 
we're not good at it yet, but we're, we're getting there, right? And, and uh, the technology keeps moving in that direction. Research is constantly ongoing from every country in the world. All the smartest people in the world are doing research on vaccines to find a way to fix this thing, right? There's no reason based upon our understanding. Now, that's the scientific kind of secular mind, my thought process. And the other part is be optimistic because Allah says we should be, right? Allah is the one in control, right? And so uh, uh, if you think of our lives as uh, having a dance with Qadr, right? And Allah the one guiding guiding us on that dance, right? This is just us being guided, uh, you know, as, as the follower in this, in this, in this, in this, uh, thing that we do. Uh, and, and there's no reason to think that the one who isn't guiding us doesn't have a really awesome, happy ending for this terrible situation. There's just no reason not to think that based upon, uh, what we know of him. So, so. And Dr. Yusuf, uh, just to quickly add to that, um, I wanted to also remind people, uh, re remind our viewers that just because you took the vaccine doesn't mean you're a superwoman or you're an invisible woman uh, or invisible man. Uh, you still do need to be careful, uh, Dr. Yusuf. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, this is a really important point, I guess, just from a scientific perspective. The vaccine has been really well studied, and 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 it shows that that no doubt a large portion of people that get the two dose vaccine from Pfizer and Moderna will develop antibodies. Um, you know, within 14 days after the second vaccine is like a really, really high percentage, somewhere above the 90s, okay, which is great news. Uh, what we know about that, though, uh, is that it will probably temper uh, or, or decrease the ability to get sick from the virus. However, it doesn't mean that you can't be a carrier of the virus. We don't have literature that shows that. Inshallah, that's the case. But right now, uh, it's kind of fuzzy, gray stuff. And, and so you can be vaccinated or had the virus in the past even, which is really uncomfortable to say out loud, and uh, be a carrier of the virus and convey it to somebody else. Um, at least that's what the literature has not clarified yet. And so, so I would just be careful, do all the things that we know we should be doing. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll poke Huda and say, Huda, you can leave the house. Just leave it in a safe way, right? And you know, you don't have, no, she just wants to stay there forever. Uh, I think it's just Huda's personality. She's stuck in Baltimore and misses New Jersey. So, so you know, the the. But I think I think uh, there are ways to do this. There are ways to navigate this, um, and, and we don't have to be in bunkers with 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 uh, you know radios. We're not there yet, right? Um, alhamdulillah. There, there's ways that we know can, we can manage this from a scientific perspective uh, and, and really decrease this for those that we love and care about in the community as a whole um, and still have a meaningful quality of life and, and do good things. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much for covering that, Dr. Yusuf. Uh, Dr. Marjwal, did you want to add anything? Um, yeah, just one last thing, you know, helping us get day to day, um, you know, I get through each day, but just, you know, trying to create some sort of structured routine. If it's waking up at the same time every day, putting the kids to the, to bed the same time every day, having lunch together at the same time, still getting dressed, you know, when you, uh, go to, you know, work or, you know, working from home, um, you know, having some kind of normalcy, whatever that routine might be. Some people like journaling in the morning or doing some meditation at night, you know, something that can kind of help you remember, you know, pre-pandemic life and um, scheduling, th scheduling things that we you would look forward to. You know, we humans love having something to look forward to, whether it's a new movie at the end of the week with the family or getting carry out from the frame, favorite restaurant. Um, starting a new hobby together, game night, something that you can look forward to for the weekend, you know, is, is um, really helpful for our mood. That's, I mean, that was great. One thing that we do, that we've picked up as a family is we do our weekly Zoom um, halakha every Sunday. And what we do is the whole family gets together on Zoom and it's our time. It's, it's basically our in my, I live so far away from everybody, so that's that's my family time, um, and I, it's not that hard. It's not that hard to finally get used to Zoom. I feel like at this point, all of the moms and dads and uncles and aunts have finally gotten used to using Zoom. Um, so I strongly encourage that. Uh, I love it. Uh, I love being able to see my family, seeing the kids, seeing my aunts and uncles, even if it's once a week. But at least it 
continues that. I mean, from going from that, seeing them in person, we used to see each other in person all the time. And this is the best that we can do at this point. Um, so that's my advice to our viewers. Uh, try to try to schedule some family time. You know, consider it, consider it a family um, gathering. We used to have, you know, family dinners. Instead of those family dinners, let's get together and do a Zoom dinner. And everyone could just sit around and have dinner together and you'll get to still see your family and friends. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Uh, Susie, Dr. Raisa, for taking time out of your Thursday night. I do. I know that you guys have a very long, busy day at work, and um, I really do, on behalf of, Assam of Penny Appeal, I do thank you for coming out and for joining us tonight. Jazakallah um, khairan. Wassalamu alaikum. Thank you. Did good, Heather. Thank you. Yeah. Take care.